In the previous lecture series, we talked about the importance of the DNA molecule as one of the big characteristics of life is that all life is based on genetic material. But when you look at a life form and you experience everything that it is and everything that it does, it's really proteins that you are observing. Proteins have multiple jobs in life forms and they're basically constitute the phenotype in Mendelian definitions. Look at humans, for example. Proteins do immune response, regulation, recognition, transport, movement, structure, enzymatic catalysis, and storage for future use. Proteins have multiple jobs, and they do everything that you, it is about you. So proteins are definitely important, and for some people you could argue, just as important as DNA is. What good is this to have the blueprint if you don't have a building? How good is this to have the blueprint of the school if you don't have the school itself? Although, of course, you couldn't have the school without a blueprint that made you built it in the first place. So that's the eternal argument of the chicken or the egg kind of thing, especially when you consider from the last video that you need proteins to stabilize the structure and the replication process of the DNA molecule. But either way, one thing is for sure. The information that it comes to make proteins comes from DNA. The same way that genotype determines phenotype, DNA determines proteins. How the information go from DNA to proteins is the key about this video lecture series, where we're going to talk about protein synthesis or gene expression. But we're going to talk about the fact that the bridge between DNA and proteins is made by a molecule called RNA that serves as the link that actually does the protein synthesis. And there's some proteins involved in that as well. So proteins, definitely very important. Before we start on that, let's review some basics. First of all, proteins. Proteins are polypeptides, which are basically large strings of amino acids strung together by peptide bonds. Peptide bonds form when the amino group of one amino acid donates a hydrogen or a proton and the carboxyl group of an adjacent amino acid donates a OH or a hydroxyl group and they actually combine to form OH plus H, H2O. That is a process that we call dehydration synthesis. It is a anabolic process that actually requires energy and cells will do this to actually build bigger molecules which we call proteins. And in this case you form a peptide bond which is called a peptide bond but in other cases you do the same kind of thing to make carbohydrates and to make lipids as well. But in proteins, peptide bonds will string several amino acids in a long chain that we call a polypeptide. These amino acids are basically made of a central carbon surrounded by four different things. They have a hydrogen hat, a side chain, an amino group, and a carboxyl group. The amino group will give alkaline properties to the molecule and the carboxyl group will give acidic properties to the molecule, making it overall neutral. Also notice, by the way, that every protein starts with an amino group, which is called the N-terminus, and ends with a carboxyl group, which is called the C-terminus. Either way, the carboxyl group and amino group will not be the difference between amino acids. The difference is that side chain, or the R chain. And whatever, depending on what you add to that side chain, you're going to make different amino acids. And you see here represented the different side chains which show up in humans, and there's 21 different ones there, as you can see. There are actually more amino acids than that in nature. Nature would actually have between 20 and 25 different types of amino acids, depending on which kind of organisms you study. But in humans, you only see these 21, and in fact, you only see actually 20. But it is possible to synthesize as many as 39 different types of amino acids, because 19 out of these 20 can be synthesized on the opposite way. What do I mean by that? You can actually get amino acid that looks like this, as you see in the picture on the top left, and we invert its, its structure to make a mirror image of it, in which is basically called a structural enantiometer, or a mirror image molecule. Now, these things don't actually get produced naturally, but in the laboratory, we can actually create that and string them together to create synthesized proteins, which can possibly have different functions because if you have a different amino acid you're going to have a different structure and different structure equals different functions so we try to explore this non-natural amino acids to create new kinds of proteins with different functions which you can maybe have medicine applications or all sorts of different things in biology but either way these 20 different kinds of amino acids which show up mostly in humans are enough to spell all the different kinds of diversity of life Imagine that all life forms are made of proteins with all those functions we talked about at the beginning of this video. How can you possibly make all of that with just 20 building blocks? Well, think about it. Carbohydrates only have three kinds of building blocks. You have glucose, galactose, and fructose strung together in different orders to make the different carbohydrates that you have. Lipids basically are made of glycerol and long chains of amino acids, so only basically two types of molecules. 
And then DNA will be made of five different kinds of monomers or adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil, and thymine. Uh, uracil, of course, is the one that shows up in RNA instead of thymine. But they only have four, basically, building blocks in either RNA or DNA. So you have carbohydrates with three building blocks, DNA with four building blocks, and the lipids with as many as two different kinds of building blocks. You do also have steroids and other kinds of lipids which have different structures, but on average, these building blocks. Compare that with the 20 different kinds of building blocks that proteins make, and you quickly start realizing how why proteins are the most diverse group of macromolecules there is. Because there's so many building blocks, you can make so many different things. Think of it as getting Lego pieces and making all sorts of different things, putting those different Lego pieces together. Imagine, for example, the analogy of the languages. You have English, Portuguese, Spanish, French, German, and so many other languages which are based on the same kind of alphabet. You have the same basic 20 letters. Now, some languages will have more, some languages will have less, just like you have in life, different kinds of amino acids and different organisms. But 20 letters was enough to make all the words of the English language, Spanish language, French, Japanese, all of these different things you can make with just those 20 letters. And that makes puts in perspective how much variety you can create with those 20 different building blocks because you can create words of different lengths and of different orders of these words. And that's why different structures will create lots of different functions for proteins and proteins became the one of the most important molecules of life. The structure of proteins actually has four different kinds of levels of organization. First, you get the string of amino acids, which is called the polypeptide chain, which is strung together by peptide bonds on what we call the primary structure of proteins. Now, depending on the primary structure of proteins, there might be attractions between the R chains of different kinds of amino acids. And then those attractions, or hydrogen bonds between the different side chains, will cause the molecule to actually fold in specific patterns. The two most common patterns are the alpha helix that you see there and the beta sheet. And the alpha helix will basically look like a twisted ladder, but not double twisted like DNA is. And it will also make the same kind of diffraction picture, which is, by the way, how we knew the DNA had to be helical, because we already had seen protein pictures which were helical just like DNA was. And you have the beta place, which is kind of like an up and down kind of thing, where attractions between the, the ends of the protein cause the, the molecule to kind of fold and make these sheets. You put these beta plates and sheets together in different conformations and you make what's called the tertiary structure of proteins, which is held together by hydrogen bonds and disulfide bridges. Some side chains of amino acids have sulfur in it, which is something that is the only molecule, by the way, of the four macromolecule classes which has sulfur inside of it, which is one way you can actually help identify proteins by actually seeing which molecule has sulfur in it. Either way, disulfide bridges and hydrogen bonds will all help create what's called the tertiary structure of proteins, and the majority of proteins will have a globular tertiary structure, or basically a mass of, of different structures strung together. By the way, some proteins will have fibrous structures where they actually have long chains kind of caught up on each other. Think of hair, and that's an example of that. But the majority of proteins will be globular in shape. Now, some proteins will actually have several of these tertiary structures put together. We call each tertiary structure a subunit. And you get these different subunits and you add them together to make actual proteins which are quaternary structure or built of smaller proteins. The majority of enzymes, for example, is only one tertiary structure. But if you start getting several tertiary structures and strung them together, you make a larger protein with many functions. Each tertiary structure giving the protein a special function. Or we call that protein domains or regions of a large protein which give the protein a special function. And different proteins will have different domains and therefore have different functions. And if you were to add the domain of a protein to another, you might actually enhance the, dom that, the function of that protein or make it worse. And that's actually how mutations sometimes take place in our bodies. When you compare DNA versus protein, though, it starts to become clear why people were confused about which one of them was the most important. Because DNA only has four monomers, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, while proteins have 20. DNA only has one basic structure, the double helix, while proteins can make thousands of different types of structures. Everything you're made of, all the body systems are made of combinations of different kinds of proteins. Well, DNA basically only has the genes. But the thing is that you wouldn't have the proteins if it, if it wasn't for the genes. 
DNA was proven by experiments such as Murphy and Chase, Griffins, and Avery experiments that they were actually the genetic factor. Remember, we talked about that in the last video lecture series. And so DNA is the Mendelian factor of genetics. But how can a molecule that has less diversity than proteins, has less monomers, less variety in structure, and it's not as abundant as the proteins are, how can a molecule that's less complex make something more complex than it is? That is the question that puzzled scientists for a very, very long time until we actually understood the process of protein synthesis. And in a different video, we're going to talk about how they actually achieved this through research. But remember that we discover DNA structure through the efforts of scientists like Adam Shargraf, which studied the chemical composition, and Rosalind Franklin, which took pictures of, with X-ray diffraction machines to prove the DNA was, was a helical, and Watson and Crick, which actually developed the double helix model of the DNA molecule. You also discover the function of the DNA molecule as a genetic factor through studies such as the Avery study, which replicated Griffith's transformation study, identifying that DNA was the only thing you needed to add to make the bacteria change, and Hershey and Chase's studies with bacteriophages, proving that only the pro DNA was important to get inside. Protein was not necessary to make the actual virus change the bacteria. Then, after that, you got people like Morgan and Stuart Vaught, which studied the chromosomal structure and inheritance patterns of DNA and proved beyond any reasonable doubt that DNA is the genetic key. But how can DNA be the genetic key and make protein? How does DNA become protein? Well, that's the process of gene expression. Before you can understand that, you have to understand that DNA actually stores multiple genes inside of it. Each DNA molecule actually is a sequence of many genes strung together next to each other. With sequences in between to kind of space them out. In the DNA will be in the nucleus of the cell, but the protein synthesis will happen in the cytoplasm, in those little machines that we call the ribosomes, which might be free around the cytoplasm if the protein is being made for the use inside the cell or attached to the rough ER if the protein is going to be exported from the cell. But how does that information from the nucleus go to the ribosomes, which are in the middle of the cytoplasm? Through a molecule that's called RNA. And the RNA will have actually three different kinds which will be doing this job. First, the DNA is transcribed into RNA, and then the RNA is translated into protein. And that's basically what protein synthesis is all about. That means that DNA contains the code or the master plan for all the information. RNA is a transcribed copy of one gene. It's like the blueprint for what you want to actually do. And the ribosome will actually be the translation factory which actually makes the copy process. DNA, it will be like the mainframe or the library, the thing that contains all the web pages or all the books with all the information to do everything in your body. RNA will be like a website, a little piece of what's inside the mainframe or like a page in the book. And then the ribosomes will be like the actual interface that you're using to actually create something with that information. This analogy helps you understand the different roles of these things in the cell. And it's interesting enough, RNA will actually have many roles. You're going to have an RNA that's the copy of the gene that takes the message to the cytoplasm. That's called the messenger RNA. You have an RNA that's actually part of the ribosome itself. It's called ribosomal RNA. And you have an RNA that picks up the amino acids that need to be uh, added to the protein and actually interprets which one is the next one to be put in the sequence and puts them there. And that's the transfer RNA. And through this process, the gene becomes a protein. Every gene in your body has the information to make one protein. And that's the whole idea of the gene theory of protein synthesis, which every gene contains information to make one protein. Remember, however, that since proteins will have different domains or different subunits sometimes, sometimes the gene is split. Sometimes the pieces that make a protein might be in different genes. Sometimes you need multiple genes to make one protein. And also, as we're going to learn in this lecture series, there's actually junk in between the actual coding pieces of the DNA, which means that this junk needs to be removed before you can actually make the protein. And that comes with the idea of the split gene theory of, of genetics, which is the idea that sometimes proteins, the actual code that's in the gene, has junk in between that must be deleted before the protein can be made, and that sometimes it takes many genes to actually make one protein since proteins are made of different subunits. In the next video, we will talk about how this process actually works, starting with transcription. I'll see you guys then.